Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. I want us to look together at the giver and the gift and the hands that hold us eternally. I want you to turn with me to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, and this is the Good Shepherd chapter, and I just quoted to you verses 27 through 30 of John chapter 10. And I want you to be reminded once again that we are looking together at the Joseph of the New Testament. And of course, we know that Jesus is the Joseph of the New Testament. And remember again of how that Jacob pronounced the blessing upon his son Joseph in the 49th chapter of the book of Genesis, verses 22 through 24. And he said, Joseph is a climbing vine that has been planted by a well, and his branches are even climbing over the wall. And so Joseph was represented as that unstoppable climbing vine who is a life-giving vine. And of course, we find that in the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. At verse 1, Jesus said, I'm the true vine. And then in verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And so back in the 45th chapter of Genesis, when Joseph was reconciled to his brothers and reunited with his brothers, he said to him in verse 11, he said, I want you to come down to the land of Egypt and I will nourish you. And then in verse 18, he said, and I will give you the good of the land. And so we're looking together in the gospel of John. And in the gospel of John, the Joseph of the New Testament, our Lord Jesus we find him stating seven I gives. And we've already noticed together the fourth chapter, verse 14, and he told the woman at the well that he would give her living water. And then in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John at verse 51, he said, I will give you the bread of life. And then today, here in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, he says, I give unto you eternal life. And again, Jesus said, and my sheep, they hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. Now, when it comes to the Gospel of John, I don't avoid the so-called difficult passages. And last week was a difficult passage because we looked together in that sixth chapter, verse 51, where Jesus said, I give unto you the bread of life, and the bread of life that I'm talking about is my own flesh. And except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And I went into detail to explain the significance of those verses of Scripture that Jesus was not referring to the Lord's Supper. There's no way that he would have been talking about the Lord's Supper with such a disagreeable crowd, a crowd that was always in variance with him, and he had not yet even spoken of the Lord's Supper to the inner circle of disciples. He's talking about what food is to the body. We know that Jesus is to our spirit. And we can look at food, we can observe food, and I know that most of you in this room, you don't have any difficulty consuming food, but the difference in America and the rest of the world is this. We live to eat, and the rest of the world, they eat in order to be able to live. And so we've got it backwards, and it got quiet in here, but I'm used to that along the way, and I'm not going to preach on gluttony. But we need to eat as much of Jesus as what we do of the natural. And if we were eating the bread of life like we do the natural food that is presented to us, we'd be far stronger Christians than what we are. And then today we come to this 10th chapter. And he says, And I give unto them eternal life, 
and they shall never perish. Let me qualify it in the beginning now. He's talking about his sheep. He said, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Now, I can't qualify it for it. You're going to have to qualify it for yourself whether or not you are really his sheep. Now, I know today that I'm one of his sheep. And I'm living in the security right now that I'm in the hand of Jesus. And Jesus said, and no man shall be able to pluck you out of my hand. And then I've got double coverage according to verse 29. And my Father, which gave you me, is greater than all. And no man shall be able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. I have eternal life, and I have it right now. Now, I know some of you may not be convinced of that. And can be, we really be persuaded that this is an exceeding great and precious promise? Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to give you the truth. And if you want to live in the assurance that you have eternal life, it's available to you. Now, that's the only thing I'm going to do today is to present the truth to you, and then you decide whether or not you are truly one of his sheep because his sheep are going to hear him, his sheep are going to follow him, and we're going to look at this together in detail. And I pray that someone will go away being persuaded that this is an exceeding great and precious promise. As Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, According to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so I think that's a wonderful reference to the sheep again, that we become partakers with the shepherd and we know that we are held in his nail-scarred hand. And over top of the nail-scarred hand and the finished work of the shepherd, we've got the hand of God the Father. And no man shall be able to pluck you from my Father's hand. We will never be snatched away. Now, if you want to be persuaded about this, here's what we have to do. We have to go to this 10th chapter, and we have to recognize the claims of Christ, what he claims to be, and what he claims that he is able to do. And so look with me, beginning back in verse 7, all the way through the 11th verse of this 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, and we find the two first claims that Jesus makes concerning his person and concerning his power. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And so notice these first two claims of Jesus. He says, first of all, I'm the door. I'm easily identified. I am the way into the sheepfold. And not only am I the door, I'm also the good shepherd. And these two terms, really and truthfully, they are absolutely and completely inseparable one from the other. He's talking about folding the sheep back in a, a little cubby hole somewhere, back in a little canyon, a little place where they could be secure. And then the shepherd himself becomes the door. He lies down as the gate, and none can get in, and none can get out, except they cross over top of the shepherd. And it's in and through and by him, they're in the fold, and it's in and through and by him that they can ever get out of the fold. He is the good shepherd, and he is the door of the sheepfold. I'm glad that I'm behind the door. I'm glad that I've been covered by the finished work 
of the good shepherd. You'd say, well, I just don't believe he's able to keep. Well, you just go ahead in your own mind. You're talking about you and you're not talking about the shepherd. And here's what I dare you to do after this service. Anyone that wants to write to me or come up and debate with me that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow. Don't you come up here one moment in my face and suggest the incompetency of the shepherd. He is totally and completely competent and to say I can be saved today and lost tomorrow is a detrimental comment to the shepherd. And here's what I believe today. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If David could be inspired by the Holy Ghost to write such words even before Jesus, Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death for us on the cross, was raised again the third day, ascended now to the right hand of all power and all glory. If he could make such a confident statement as the six verses of the 23rd Psalms, don't dare tell me today that he's not able to keep, that he's not able to save absolutely and completely to the uttermost. What you're worried about is your old ragged living. I'm not worried about the raggedness of the shepherd because he is the door and he is the good shepherd and he's proven it. He said, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And there has never been anyone that died such a death as Jesus died. Matter of fact, he is the original volunteer because Jesus, he had his life to give it or to keep it. The rest of us, we're going to die anyway if Jesus tarries and delays his coming. But he had the choice. He didn't have to die, but willingly, sacrificially, substitutionarily, Jesus died in my place and for my benefit on the cross. And I know today, Day, he must be, he has to be a keeping shepherd. And so the first two claims that we find here, he says, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. But notice the next claim that Jesus makes. Listen to verses 24 and 25 of this 10th chapter. He says in verse 24, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus, he answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Now watch, listen to what he says. He says, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Now you got to qualify yourself whether or not you're really his sheep, but listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said, I'm the Messiah. I'm not only the good shepherd and the door to the sheepfold and you enter in by me and then you're saved and you're kept in the sheepfold by my character, by my power, by my authority. But he also says, I am the Messiah. Now let me tell you what's going around today. You need to be aware of this. And these are some modern day preachers that are very, very famous. And listen to what they're saying about the Jewish people. They're saying that they're under another covenant. And they don't have to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. That God has made a provision for the Jewish people. And if they, I, you'd be shocked if I told you who. Because some of you listen to them and you read after them. Who you need to be listening to and reading after is your 41-year pastor that stood in front of you all these years and rightly divided the Word of God. There is not a separate covenant for Jew or Gentile that avoids the cross and the name of Jesus. Even Peter preached it on the day of 
Pentecost are there right after in the fourth chapter. He said, neither is salvation found in any other. For there is no other name given un, uh, among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's not a separate covenant for the Jews that avoids the fact that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jews. And not only is he the Messiah of the Jews, he is also the Messiah of the Gentiles. And so they said, you're causing us to doubt. We just want you to tell us plainly, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus said, just look at the works that I've been doing right in front of you. Has anyone else ever been able to do the works that I've done? Go back to the third chapter of John for just a moment and let's listen again to the testimony of John the Baptist when they considered that John the Baptist might be the Messiah. Messiah, the anointed one, the one that was sanctified and sent, the one that could fill all three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And there's never been one of the Old Testament that could fulfill all three offices of being prophet, priest, and king. And so listen, Listen to what they said to John. He said, ye yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah, but that I'm sent before him. That's Malachi chapter 3, that he was the forerunner. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. John said, I've done my job. I have done my job. I've introduced him. I've been the porter. You can read about him in the first 10 verses of the Gospel of John. And I have introduced the good shepherd and the true door to the nation of Israel. And I've declared, here he is. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I have fulfilled my mission. Listen to what he says in verse 30. He said, I've still got joy. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. And he that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. He said Jesus came down from heaven. He has to be the Messiah. Now, we think many times that John had a season of doubt. And doubt's going to come to all of us. And that's what I'm trying to refute today. If we could get over our doubts and become fully persuaded that we are saved and kept by the power and the authority of the door, the good shepherd, the Messiah, we could get on with the business of winning other people to Christ. But until we're fully persuaded, we're not going to be very persuasive. And so look at the 11th chapter of Matthew. And this is when John sent two of his disciples to Jesus to ask if he was really the one or should they be looking for another? Now, I'm not sure about all this, but I'm just going to give you two different opinions as you follow along in Matthew 11 at verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison, John's getting ready to be beheaded, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Now, I'm not sure if it was John that needed the affirmation or if it was these two disciples that needed to hear from Jesus himself. I'm really not sure. Some people say, well, it was just John that had a big season of doubt. If he did, that doesn't bother me. John is still a biblical hero of mine. And John went further than I've ever gone. And John went further than you've ever gone. And none of us today, we don't have any authority. We don't have any right whatsoever to criticize John the Baptist. But maybe he wanted to send these two men for a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus because he knew that two of his disciples were not completely convinced. And so take it either way that you want it. I'm just shelling it out there. Now, when John heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, and here's the mistake that they made. They did this openly. You can read about it in the other gospel account. They did it openly. They should have went to Jesus privately. And so when they did it openly, Jesus is going to have to come back publicly and defend the character of John. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. 
and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude, now watch this, on the day then that John may have thought the worst thing that he ever thought about Jesus, if he was truly the one, Jesus said the best things about John that could ever be said. Aren't you glad that he's our advocate with the Father? Aren't you glad that he's our mediator and our intercessor? And on the day that I have my worst doubts about Jesus, and I think my worst thoughts about him, at the right end of the Father, he says the best things about me. And he says, Father, he's behind the door, and I'm his shepherd, and I'm the promised Messiah, prophet, priest, and king of Israel. And I've given him the promise, and I've given to him eternal life. And he shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck him out of my hand. And my Father which gave him me is greater than all, and no man shall be able to pluck him out of my Father's hand. And when we think the worst of Jesus, he says the best about us. And he says, Blessed is he, verse 6, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed? Shaken with the wind, what went ye out to the for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Malachi 3.11, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's talking about being a servant and just being willing to serve. And so again, he's confirming to these two men and to the audience and to John, if he gets the message back in prison, there's nothing else that needs to be done. There's nothing else that needs to be said. I'm the Messiah. Let that confirm the fact that I'm the one that is able to give you the promise I give unto you eternal life, and ye shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. Let's go a little bit further. He says, not only am I the door and the good shepherd and the Messiah. Look at verses 30 through 33. He says, I am one with God. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them and said, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me for? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for the blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. He said, I and the Father are one. That's how John begins his gospel. Look back in John chapter 1 and notice how that he starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Watch, underline it. The same was in the beginning with God. Am I quoting it right? I'm not looking at it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Same in nature. Same in character. Same in power, same in attributes, same in authority, same in personality. And Paul explains it in Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He is not only God the Son, he is also the Son of God. He is the same in nature, same in character, same in personality, same in power. And they were ready to stone him because he made himself equal with God. Well, that's the one that's given me the promise. And I give unto you eternal life. And you shall never perish. And neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. And my Father which gave you me is greater than all. And no man shall be able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. And this is the fourth time now in the Gospel of John they're ready to kill him. 
but they couldn't. You can go back to the fifth chapter, 16 and 18. They were ready to kill him. Seventh chapter, verse 1, they were ready to kill him. Eighth chapter, verse 59, they were ready to kill him. And now they're ready to pick up stones and they're ready to kill him. Even though that the capital offense punishment it lied completely in the hands uh, of the Romans. This mob, this lynch mob, was ready to go beyond the Romans, and they were ready to stone Jesus for saying that him and the Father are one. Now, what they were ready to stone him for is my assurance. It's my confidence. If he's not one with the Father, if he was not God in flesh, then we were all still in our sins. And there's no hope of the resurrection. There's no hope of seeing our loved ones again. But today, if we believe that he is one with the Father, then I can hold on to the promise. And I give unto you eternal life, and you shall never perish. And neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. Stay with me now. You may not agree. That's all right. I'm going to preach the truth and live the truth whether you want to or not. The next thing that he says, he says, I'm not only the door and the good shepherd. I'm not only the Messiah. I'm not only one with God. But now in verses 34 through 36, he actually says, I am the son of God. And Jesus answered them. And he said, is it not written in your law? I said, you're God's. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say of them whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world that blasphemous because I said I am the Son of God. You say, preacher, that's confusing to me. Well, I've studied it for you. And let me give you the idea of it. It goes back to Exodus chapter 22, 18 to 22. It's also found in Psalms 82. Probably the biggest mistake that Moses ever made, according to my son Boyd. And I think that Boyd's got a good analogy. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was the priest of Midian. He was not a true monotheistic Jew. He believed in many deities. Now, he gave Moses some advice and gave her, him a daughter, but I think that Jethro had his own problems. And when Moses was judging the 12 tribes of Israel, he went to Moses and said, this is too big for one man. You need to elect some elders. And they did 70. And then later on, they called them gods in Exodus 22 because they had the authority to judge. That's what Jesus is referring to. He said, I claim to be the Son of God, but yet in your scripture, the Jewish Torah that cannot be broken, inerrant, infallible, they called the 70 elders of Israel gods, and none of those men parallel with me. None of those men are on the same level with me. Matter of fact, I tell you about those men. They led a revolt against Moses in the wilderness. And they tried to overthrow the Arianic priesthood. And they wanted to do away with Aaron and what God ordered. And they wanted to get rid of Moses. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. And sometimes when we got 70 deacons or 70 trustees or 70 so-called elders in a church, they can cause a great deal of discord. And they did for Moses. That's why, and Jesus said, you would call them gods. But I come in perfect harmony, perfect unity with the Scripture. I've entered in by the door. I've come the right way. And the porter has opened the door and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And you can see me in Genesis. And you can see me in Exodus. And you can see me in Leviticus. And you can see me in Numbers. And you can see me in Deuteronomy. And you can see me in Joshua. And you can see me in Judges. And you can see me in Ruth. And you can see me in the Kings. And you can see me in the Chronicles. My footprints are all through the Old Testament pages and there's no doubt about it that every prophetic finger was pointing to me and you would call those men that so discord in the wilderness and try to usurp the authority of Moses and Aaron you refer to them as gods and I say now that I'm the son of God and you're ready to stone me for it you'll just have to go ahead and do what you're going to do because I cannot deny who I am I'm more than the son of Mary and more than the son of Joseph and Joseph knew or not 
God, but I was the incarnate form son of God by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary. I came down from heaven above and I declare to you with all authority, I'm the son of God and I give you a promise. I give unto you eternal life and neither shall you perish and neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. Don't argue with me about the eternal security of the believer. You're suggesting that our shepherd is totally and completely incompetent and he may not be the son of God. Now you still decide whether or not you're a sheep. Now I know I'm a sheep. I don't know about you. I know I am. I know I've heard his voice. I know every time I start to wander away, I hear his voice. I know every time I start to wander away, away I get his rod. His rod and his staff. They do what? His correction and his protection. There's a dual side to Jesus. Everybody wants his protection, but they don't want the correction. He gives me more correction because in his correction, it's a form of his protection. And so here he is. He is the door. He is the good shepherd. He is the Messiah. He is one with the Father. And he is the Son of God. And so all of this, he's the Messiah also. I need to add that one. Let me give one more right here. And then we find that God is in him and he's in God. Listen to what he says in 37 and 38. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Well, we run to Paul in Colossians. And in Colossians 1.19 it said, And it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Colossians 2 and 9 says, And the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus bodily. I and the Father are one. I'm trying to show you who's making this promise. He said, And I give unto you eternal life, and you shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. My Father which gave you me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. You'd say, Preacher, I can believe I can be lost again. Then you're not a sheep. If you're truly a sheep, you're going to understand the keeping power of the shepherd. Now let's see who it is that's promising once again. It's the door. It's the good shepherd. It's the Messiah. It's the one that is one with God. It is the one that who is the son of God. It is the one that him and God, they're in each other. And if they're in each other, oh, then I'm in them. And then my life is hid in Christ, in God. Colossians chapter 3 at verse 3. And so in 27 through 29, there is no other place in the scripture where we find a stronger affirmation of the absolute security of all true Christians. Now listen to me. I pay a price for preaching the truth. I've got a lot of friends out there of other denominations. And some of them may part ways with us after this. Some of them I say, I've never sent another offering. Can't believe that he's preaching the absolute security, or what we call it, the eternal security of the believer. I just can't believe preachers on that. Now, you know that people can be saved and lost, 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 saved and lost. I want to know what unsaves you. When Jesus said, and I give unto you eternal life, and you shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand, and my Father which gave you me is greater than all, and no man shall be able to pluck you out of my Father's hand, I and my Father are one. The promise that I'm giving you is also from the Father. You can count on it. You can write it down. You can stand on it. You can even say as Paul, I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep, to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. If you want to be saved and lost, go on. But I don't want to live that torturous life. And again, I'm going to tell you, how would I ever be confident of preaching a saved person's funeral? What would they have done maybe right up at the end that would eliminate them? You'd say, no, there's big sins and there's little sins. Not in the economy of God. 
In the economy of God, he died for all sin. No, if a man becomes an adulterer, if a man becomes a drunkard, what if you, knowing the truth, don't do the truth? What about the sin that you omitted? Uh, James 4, 17, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth to not, him and it is sin. What about all the times you not attended church on Wednesday? What about all the times you didn't come back on Sunday night? What about all the times you didn't pray with somebody when they needed prayer? What about all the times you failed to be a witness? Oh, I'm telling you, heavy, heavy is hanging over our head. That that wouldn't mean that you'd have to go into adultery or drunkenness or whatever it might be to be lost again. I'm told about what we do know and we're responsible for that. How would I ever preach a saved person's funeral? We don't know what they failed to do that they were supposed to do. And so take their name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Boy, that's a weight. Now, I know some of you lazy Baptists, you're liking this. Because you're saying, boy, I can just go on living the same old ragged Christian life I've been living. Preachers give me all the evidence. Listen to what Paul says. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And that attitude that I've got my fire insurance and I'm going to live the way I want to now is a sure and certain sign you're not his sheep. You've never belonged to him to begin with. That's the reason you don't hear his voice. That's the reason that you don't have a consciousness about the way that a child of God is supposed to live. You remember the threefold judgment of a believer? I've already been judged as a sinner. And every day I'm being judged as a son. And one day I'm going to be judged as a servant. I'm going to have to give an account of the deeds that I've done in this body and what I've done with my ministry. And so are you. And right now I'm being judged. What kind of son of God am I today? Am I an obedient son of God? Am I a loving, faithful, a willing son of God? I'm being judged for that every day that I live. That's the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. But my judgment is a sinner. That's John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say, to you. He that heareth my word believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. You're going to need this sometime. You better be listening to me because you might be like John if John doubted as close as you can walk. When you get down to the end and death is knocking at your door, you're going to need to know I'm saved and I can hold on to the promise I give unto you eternal life. You shall never perish and neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. My Father which gave you me is greater than all and no man shall be able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. Let me tell you something, dear friend. I see it too much and I'm weary with it and I've got to go to it this evening where death is imminent. It's even at the door. You better have something more than your works. You better have something more than your righteousness. You better have something more than making the claim, I held out. I'm going to hold on. Bless God, I'm not trying to hold on. I'm looking to the one that's holding me. That's my only hope. That's my only confidence. If I try to hold out and hold on, my hands are weak and my hands are feeble and my hands are made of clay. And what I say I'm going to do, I don't do. And the very thing that I say that I would never do is the thing that I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. But thank God today I got got a great Savior who's given me a great promise. Now watch. 